off the sheet, a few questions here. What was the most obvious thing about how the sheep acted? Lizzie. Dumb. Okay, I suppose that could be a summary of their actions. They're not that smart. Looking for something else. They needed somebody to care for them. Okay, they need care. Anybody else? They recognize the shepherd's voice. Yes, that's true. I'm looking for something else. John. They stay in groups. They stay in groups. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Although everything else is true as well. A very obvious characteristic of sheep is that a flock of sheep. They have this herd mentality that they just stick together. And then we looked at the shepherd. Now, how is the shepherd different from a thief or a robber? What's the main difference? Jesse. He takes care of them. Okay. He takes care of them. Jonathan. The shepherd enters through the gate, the robber go over the fence. Yeah, he comes in the right way. And how is the shepherd different from the hireling? Listen. The hireling runs away. Why? He's scared because he doesn't oh, care. What? Because he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Okay. He runs when danger comes. So we could sort of summarize everything in, in a question. When we looked at the sheep, the question was one of identity. Are you a sheep? Identification. When we look at the shepherd, it's a question of communion. Do you know the shepherd? And tonight, now, this, this last thing we're going to look at is going to be sort of assuming that, that by God's grace you're able to answer yes to both of those questions. But wherever you are tonight, this is a question of application. So if you are a sheep, and if you know the shepherd, are you following him? Now we've looked at that some before, but um, we see that this is a natural result of knowing who you are and being in communion with the shepherd is that you follow. And we see this summarized in verse 27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And that could sort of be a key verse for the whole chapter. Just, it's all there. They hear, they know the shepherd, they're his sheep, and they follow. And notice that this is not optional. This is just who they are. If you're a sheep, you follow. This is just, it goes together. This is just the way they are. This is their nature. And then one thing before we get started, I want to point out, we're calling this the security of submission. And submission being following the shepherd. Meaning that it's not what you want to do, but it's you're following the shepherd. You're submitting to him. But your security is not because you submit. Now, uh, it's hand in hand. Because we said, well, how do you know the difference between a lost sheep and a sheep that's wandering? Because we said a sheep that's off by itself, it's either sick or it's lost. And so, when you're off by yourself doing your own thing, you really can't have any really concrete way of knowing that you're actually a sheep following the shepherd. And so they go hand in hand. But when a sheep wanders off, one of those sheep that the shepherd has called and given a name, and he's come and he knows the shepherd, and when he wanders off, what he would lose is that assurance of security. But he doesn't actually lose that security. Because why? This, his, the security of the sheep does not rest in who they are. And we saw that. It's like we read about the sheep. And the one thing, you know, we've always said, you know, the one thing about the sheep is that <laughs> they're, they're not going to be able to fend for themselves. If they're on their own, they're basically done for. And so the security of the sheep is in the shepherd. It's in knowing the shepherd. It's all in the shepherd that you, you're safe. Now, that doesn't mean that you can say, well, okay, I'm a, shep I'm a sheep, I know the Lord Jesus, and now I can kind of do what I want. Because 
we saw, we read that about the sheep, that, you know, he can, he can just get bitten, and, or maybe he wasn't even bitten, but he was just stressed out enough that it pushes the sheep over the edge and he dies, because they're really sensitive, they have to have careful handling. And don't think for a minute that you can think that as a Christian you can get away with doing things and doing your own thing. And I can tell you tonight that there is a heavy price to pay for doing your own thing and going on in sin. And you will know the consequences of that sin, whether it be in this life as hopefully, you know, either in repentance when you come back to the shepherd and you realize that you wandered, or when you actually get saved and begin to know God, or if you never turn, when you stand before God in the judgment, you will know. You will regret that. Temporal pleasures of sin come at a heavy price. Very heavy price. Now, we want to look here, first of all, as we think about following the shepherd. So we're sheep. We're following the shepherd. Now there's great possibilities in following the shepherd. This is, um, we saw, why did the shepherd come? What did he come to do? We saw him laying down his life. We saw this whole, you know, we think of the, the summary of all that he came to do and all of this reading about the Bible and, and God's plan and his sovereign work and everything. And to think that we could be a part of that. Imagine that we could be a part of God's plan. That we could be sheep, that we could be included in this. There's great opportunities. And as I mentioned before, Luke 12, 32 is one of my favorite verses. It says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. And just think of the opening that's before you as a sheep to follow the shepherd. Now, where does it all start? Where does it start as we follow? We saw that. We saw it's as they hear His voice. He called them. It's in the call. You see that right back in verse 3. The sheep hear His voice and He calleth His own sheep by name. In order to follow, you have to be called. And this call is a call of command. We said, we said it's not optional. It's an imperative. That means it's urgent. It's, it's necessary. This is very important that you follow. And it's, but it's a call of, of love. It's a call of sovereign love. And it's a call of consecration. That means being set apart. So we see that there. He calleth his own sheep. By name and leadeth them out. So as the shepherd calls you, he's saying, these are my sheep. And we saw that in his sacrificial death. When he died on the cross, it was for his sheep yeah. by name. And so when he calls you, he's saying, you're my sheep. Come be with me. Come apart. Now you belong to him. And it's a call to Christ's likeness. So when you follow the shepherd, and we saw that how the sheep, they, they trust, they, they feel safe with what they know. And what they know is the shepherd. And so as they follow him around everywhere, and the more that they know about that, the more it's, you think of animal training and everything, and it being imprinted in their minds, the more they know the shepherd, the more they're like him. Now obviously there's limits there with actual sheep, but our call is a call to Christ's likeness, to be made like the shepherd. Now this call comes with conditions. Conditions. And what I love about this, we see here all that the shepherd does first. Look at this. It says, um, well, we saw everything that he did in that he opened up the way, he laid down his life, and he died for the sheep and everything. But even after all that, it says, um, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, verse 3, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And you can just kind of, you know the sheep, they're really easily stressed, and they're not sure about new situations and everything. And so the, the shepherd calls them. 
He opens up the door. You know, he's standing out there. And he goes before them. He leads them out. You see all this that the shepherd does to try to encourage them to say, come, come on out, come follow me. But when it comes right down to it, the sheep actually have to get up and follow. They have to get up and go out. Now we saw, we see how first he's calling us the conditions, it's to sacrifice. You see there in verse 11 that, that he laid down his life. And we know throughout the Gospels how he was telling the disciples that everything that he was encountering, all the hatred, all the animosity, and how people were turning against him, and finally where he was put to death, he was saying to them, you can expect the same thing because you're my disciples, because you're following me. If they've hated me, they're going to hate you. Now, this thing about sacrifice, that sounds kind of scary sometimes. We're giving up stuff. Things have to die. And uh, we start to get uncomfortable. But uh, the thing is, everything that he asks you for to give up, he's first given to you. He's given to you that thing. And then he gives you the grace to be able to give it back to him. And I'm going to use Sarah and Joseph as an example, and I hope you guys don't mind. Yeah. Um, when they, they wanted to have a baby, and, um, and I remember Joseph praying the one night there in our Wednesday prayer meeting, and he said something like, thank you for giving him to us so that we can have the opportunity to give him back to you. I was just like, wow. You know, that's, to think about it that way, to think about the things that God gives you, and to be thankful for the opportunity to give back to Him. And so when God, when the shepherd calls you to sacrifice as a condition of following, He gives you all the grace, He gives you everything you need. He calls us out of security. Look at that there in verse now we see in verse 1 that, we, and we talked about this, there's a sheepfold. Okay, so where the sheep are, that are kept at night for safety is in the fold. There's, you know, it's probably just this enclosure, basic enclosure, with walls, a door. And it says, so the sheep are inside, because we said that in verse 9, he says, I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So when they first enter in, they're saved. Through the through the cross, through the Lord Jesus. And then we see in verse 3, as he's recounting, as he's telling them the basic story, he says that the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And so they're called out of the fold. Now, I, this, this, I had to think about this for a while. What is the fold? And uh, we know that, and you might have heard the kid's song, you know, one door and only one, and yet it's sides are two, I'm on the inside, and which side are you? And that was always confusing to me in this, because it says, he's the door, okay, I got that, you enter and you're safe. Well, it says, they'll go in and out. So the analogy, the, the, the comparison kind of falls apart, because, well, the sheep go in and out, and they're still safe. Now, <clears throat> The, the fold is not the church. The sheep are the church. The sheep are God's people. The fold is for security, safety. And there's times where the shepherd, he's calling us out of the security of what we know, even if it's what he's provided for us. He's calling us out of the security of the known to step out in faith into the unknown. And... Uh, even though we know, okay, every night we're going to go back there and we're going to be safe for the night. And every morning, you know, every evening, it's always through the one door. It's always through the blood of the cross. It's always through the Lord Jesus. Amen. But we have to step out into the field. And I want to read you two quotes from two men that kind of explained it in a way that was helpful. Uh, this one man, his name is Alexander McLaren. He was a pastor in... Great Britain in the time of Charles Spurgeon. He says, the one side, talking about the inside, is the contemplative life 
That means when you contemplate something, you're thinking it over. So the contemplative life of interior, inside union with God by faith and love, the other, the outside, is the active life of practical obedience in the field of work which God provides for us. These two are both capable of being raised to their highest power and of being discharged or uh, performed with the most unrestricted and joyous activity on condition of our keeping close to Christ and living by faith of Him. So he's saying, on the inside we have that communion with God. You know, the quiet time of devotion with God. And then we have to go out. We have to go out into the field. We have to go out and serve. And, well, outside, well, first you've got to trust the shepherd to the pastures, and we'll see that. And outside is where all the wolves are. The wolves aren't inside the fold. They're out there. There's all the danger, the uncertainty, the unknown. Matthew Henry says, True believers are at home in Christ. When they go out, they are not shut out as strangers, but have liberty to come in again. When they come in, they are not shut in as trespassers, but have liberty to go out. They go out to the field in the morning, they come into the fold at night, and in both the shepherd leads and keeps them, and they find pasture in both, grass in the field, fodder in the fold. In public, in private, they have the word of God to converse with, by which their spiritual life is supported and nourished, and out of which their gracious desires are satisfied, they are replenished with the goodness of God's house. So whether you're in there in the fold, in security, in safety, you have the shepherd still providing for you. He's still keeping you. Or if you go out, he's taking you out to pasture. So say you go in and out and you find pasture. But we said it, it, it's, it's to sacrifice. But we see even in the sacrifice, God is still going to provide for you. He's still going to take care of you. Even if you have to give up what you know, what you're sure of at times, to step out in faith. And then we also realize that the call, the conditions, is you have to deny yourself. I'll read to you Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke 9, 23. And he's just told them that he is going to suffer there in verse 22. And be killed and raised by the day. <coughs> And, he, and it says in verse 23, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world, and lose himself, or be cast away? You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross daily. And there's always that, as a sheep, there's always that inside of us that wants the easy way, we want our way. And we have to constantly be putting out the death and saying, Lord help me to follow the shepherd. Help me to follow you. And this word here, go, uh, back in John chapter 10, this is very interesting. Um, there in verse 4, it says, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And this word putteth forth is interesting, because it's mostly used, actually, in the New Testament, when they talk about casting out devils. Um, casting out devils, driving out, when the Lord, back in John chapter 2, when the Lord Jesus drives out the people that set up their booths for selling stuff in the temple. When it says that he drove them out, that's the same word. Um, when we talk about, he talks about, pray that the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into his vineyard. Send forth, that's the same word. And um, there's, there's, I looked this up in the dictionary for the Greek word, and one definition of it was, to lead forth or away somewhere with a force which he cannot resist. It's an irresistible force. And you think, well, this is violence. You say, I thought the sheep were supposed to be carefully managed and handled because they're easily stressed. But 
you see there, we've seen that the shepherd's love because he laid down his life. But there's those times where the sheep, they get determined. You know, they're all sitting down, chewing their cover, or whatever, in the fold, and they just want to sit there. And the shepherd kind of has to get them stirred up. Okay, you've got to get up, you've got to get out there. Get out into the field. And we said that it's not an option. We said it's, and so you see this. When, now first of all, you would expect that it's just in the sheep's nature to want to be with the shepherd and want to follow. But even in the times when they don't, the shepherd is there to bring them out and say, okay, we've got to get going. And then we see the rewards or the consequences of following the shepherd. Now we think consequences, that's bad. Well, not necessarily. <coughs> Look here, we see in verse 9, we talked about that a little bit, finding pasture. And then in verse Uh, verse 16, he says, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And there we see the pursuit. So the sheep follow along with the shepherd, and they find plenty, always enough, you know, Joseph has been talking about the provisions. The sheep have, they're provided for. Can you imagine the sheep thinking, well, okay, the shepherd's telling us to go out now, and if you can, can you imagine the sheep thinking to themselves, well, I hope he remembers that we need water. <laughs> I hope he remembers we need this and we need that. Well, no, they just follow. You know, they don't really think about that. I mean, they need that. You know, when they're hungry, they're going to stop and eat, and when they're thirsty, they're going to be... There's, there's signs, and the shepherd's going to know. But the sheep just follow the shepherd, and the shepherd provides for them, because he's a good shepherd. And I'll read you some verses about this. There's great rewards. There's great possibilities in following. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.8 1 Corinthians 3.8 says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Colossians 3.24 Colossians 3.24 says, well, verse 23 is included, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And then, Revelation 22, 12. The last words of the Lord Jesus to, to us, to the church. In this last chapter of the Bible, he says in Revelation 22, 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. And you think of... Uh, there's this one group, sort of like the Gideons, I think, but there's their slogan or their motto, to know Christ and to make Him known. And think how that just sums it all up, to know Christ and to make Him known. Well, there's the pastor and there's the pursuit. To know Christ, to know the shepherd, would be reward enough, would be great enough. And we saw that, you know, how the sheep don't really care where they're going as long as they're with the shepherd. And then to make him known. And to realize that the sheep, as they're all around the shepherd, he's actually using them to, to bring other sheep to himself. And just to think that we would be involved in seeing other people saved, seeing other people come to the Lord. That not what we said and not how we acted, because we saw that. We're, we're pretty pathetic as sheep. But... As the shepherd works through us, and as we start to become more like the shepherd, and then we start to see how he's working in other people, and how more sh sheep are being added. So there's the, the possibilities. Great possibilities. But there's a problem. 
there's a problem. What's stopping us? Well, us is stopping us. There's a saying that's become famous by now, but uh, this man, he was a cartoonist, he said, we have met the enemy and he is us. We have met the enemy and he is us. The sheep. You know, the sheep would... We have enough faults in us to prevent, to, to work against us, to bring about our own destruction. Without even talking about outside predators or anything like that. Now there's one thing very interesting here in John 10. You know, we, we talked about the, the, the thing that's not really mentioned right out about how the sheep are always together. And we saw that, how it's always the sheep, they're always together. But there's another thing that's not really specifically mentioned, but when you compare it to what we read about the sheep, that little paper, and when you read it here, there's something very noticeably missing. In all of John 10, there's nothing wrong mentioned with the sheep. Not a, not a single fault. Right from the very beginning, the sheep are in the sheepfold, they hear his voice, when he calls them, they follow, they come out, he puts them forth, they follow, they don't follow strangers, you know, all this stuff we went through. There's not a single thing mentioned here about the sheep that would be considered a fault. You know, you think, well, the story about the sheep, well, you say, well, the sheep are so foolish, and they were going astray, and we saw it, you know, in another part where it talks about the sheep that has gone astray. But here in John 10, not a single time, unless we consider verse 16 where, you know, he says, other sheep have I which are not of this fold, and, you know, we could sort of dig into that and say, well, okay, there's sheep that are lost. But overall, there's nothing bad mentioned about the sheep. And this, this is our position in the Lord Jesus. This is how God sees us. You think of, well, we look at ourselves and we, we say, well, there's great opportunity, but you know, like Paul says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And you know, I want to do good, but I don't do good like I would like to. But how did God see us in the shepherd? He sees us perfect. Completely perfect. And this gives us hope because we realize that one day that, how we are in Christ, how perfect we are in the Lord Jesus, that's how we're actually going to be. And so that gives us hope to say, okay, I'm going to press forward, I'm going to move on. You know the song we sang, We're Marching Design. And there's many other songs like that, We're Marching Design. I'm not going to give up. And of course, we, we are confronted with our practice, which is not what it ought to be. And one thing that was kind of interesting, you know, as I looked at this paper, um, you know, there's some animals that are really good with one or two senses, you know, like smell and hearing, and, but they're practically blind or something like that. But sheep, they're actually, they do pretty good with all five senses, a lot like people. They do just well enough to uh, get easily confused and get into trouble and, and not eat what's good for them. But they have all five senses and it's just enough to, uh, without the shepherd, we would be lost. And of course, we saw that, you know, the worse we get, the less we say, until it's too late. And, and as we read, you know, basically, and we mentioned that with all the thieves and robbers and everything, it's like they're just waiting. If only the shepherd wasn't there, we'd be gone. Isn't that a... Is that a song that says, If it had not been the Lord that was on our side, now may Israel say, If it had not been the Lord that was on our side, we would be, we would be gone. And even the most obvious characteristic, who said that? Obvious characteristic, flocking. Have I ever forgot? Anyways, their most obvious characteristic is that they flock together. Even that has been seriously compromised. And the Lord Jesus said in John 13, you know, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by if you have love one for another. And even that, we see nowadays, 
how little love the sheep, God's people, have for each other. And uh, there's a song we sing, written by Charlotte Elliott. She says, Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And may that be our heart, you know, I come. There's all the, all within me, you know, how we often say, um, false and full of sin I am. But we know the shepherd is full of truth and grace. And so if we have, on the one hand, we have infinite possibilities, the potential in God's kingdom. And, but on the other hand, almost either balancing it out or outweighing it is the problems. There's great problems. So what do we need? We need great provision. And Joseph has been talking about that. We need the provisions. We need to keep our, our eye on the shepherd. Like uh, looking at Peter. You know how Peter, when we you mentioned that, you know, when he would got out on the water and it, if he kept his eye on the Lord Jesus, he was fine. But it was when he looked around that he started to sink. There's a quote from George Mueller that I like. And George Mueller, he was a man in the 1800s in Great Britain who started a lot of orphanages. Maybe some of you, most of you have heard of him. But he, his, the amazing thing about it, and I would encourage you to read about his story if you're not familiar with it, is that how God provided for his ministry by faith. And he was one of those people that they had that conviction that they were going to do it by faith, by trusting in God to provide. Hudson Taylor was another one. And... Uh, and so you say, well, what's the secret of George Mueller? Because we don't see that today. You know, I mean, we see God providing, but we don't see it like that. And here's what he says. He says, there was a day when I died. Died to self, my opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame even of my brethren or friends. And since then, I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. And though we, we saw that with the sheep, you know, they look up and they keep tabs on where they are. And they've got to be with the flock. But it's not the other sheep that they're looking at mostly. It's the shepherd. And you've got to keep your eye on the shepherd. Realizing that First of all, everything that he's done, how could the sheep be neglected? How could they be left to perish and die if he, if he gave his very life to them? And this provision is summed up in that word life. Uh, you see that there in verse 10, John 10, 10. He says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And then in verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. <coughs> so you see there, eternal life. Over in John 17, verse 3, Again and again, what Jesus said, He did. There's never a broken promise. You know, you think of politicians, well, they only did it for the vote. No, the Lord Jesus, everything He did, he, everything He said He did, it all came to pass. And so in John 17, 3, is it okay? That's not first um, Okay, verse 12. John 17, verse 12. While I, was, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Okay, and verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So what is eternal life? You know, um, I guess that's American history, but... The, uh, you know, the people, the Spanish conquerors, they were looking for the fountain of youth. What's eternal life? 
It's not living forever. It's not living, well, I wish I could live as long as Adam or Methuselah. No, eternal life, it says here, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is never being separated from the shepherd, ever. Always with him. Never to fall away. Never to be forgotten about. Never that there would be a moment, you know, where there's all these sheep and one gets lost and gets choked up in the world and falls away. There's never a sheep that get, that's eaten up by the predators. All the sheep are always with the shepherd forever. That's eternal life. Even in the worst moment, even when you think, you know, you're going under for the last time, you're there in the valley of the shadow of death. There he's still with you. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I started with this verse to support this. And then I realized, um, well, this is hardly the beginning and it's hardly the end. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 9 and 10. And just follow with me through this. It's, okay, in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. It says, But we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And I like that. Past, present, and future. It's all covered. We saw the past. You know, we saw how the shepherd came. His sacrificial death was to deliver he doth deliver. You know, one of my favorite hymns. He's able to deliver thee. Now, turn over to chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. Turn over to chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. I'm going to have to start with verse 5, because this has been a verse that's been really helping me, some verses. You know, you think of, you know, what am I going to say to you all? And, you know, hoping, you know, not because there's anything in me, you know, because I'm so great, or that I could say things so well, but because, because God has had mercy to me, and He's allowed me to see the Lord Jesus. And I want you all to see the Lord Jesus and to really know Him, to really follow Him. And I think, well, how could I make you understand? And it's all going to be because of God. And it says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And you just stop there and you, you, you know, the same God that said, let there be light and began the universe. And the same God that speaks into hearts and, and recreates and, and gives life and causes them to know the Lord Jesus. And you think, how can, and he says in verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. There's the secret. It has to be God. It's God's power. And then it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And then chapter 6, 4 through 10. And we could probably just keep going through, but we won't. 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 10. And it's like his, Paul's testimony to these, to these people. You know, he can tell them, you know, I've been through the persecution, I've been through the suffering for your sake, for the gospel's sake, and the Lord has never forsaken me. He's never left me. In chapter 6, 4 through 10, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, 
in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. There's those paradoxes. How can they both be true? As poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And that's that eternal life in Christ, being shown in the life of Paul. And then, one second, I'm share it in the right place here. You think, well, okay, eternal life. And we said it's not living forever, but it's being with the shepherd. And even in that moment where we actually do have to die, because every one of us is going to die one day, unless the Lord Jesus comes before then. And and you think of as Joseph has been saying, you know, the valley of the shadow of death. You say, well, the death there is just a shadow. It's looming over us. And you say, well, okay, but on the moment I'm going to die, well, death won't be a shadow, it'll be a reality. But then I thought, well, or is it just the last shadow that's going to flee away before in front of the light of God's presence? And so even in, in death, we still live in the shepherd. We're still with him. Because he, he's gone before us. We saw that. He, he made the way. He went that way. And turn over to Romans 8. <coughs> verse 35. And these are very familiar verses, but if you haven't read them recently within the last week or month, you should read them again. Romans 8. 35-39. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You think of that, well there's the perfect answer to, you know, we have that summary of the sheep, you know, um, uh, they're, they're so stressed, and we get, have that whole list. Restraint, isolation, loud noises, novel situations, pain, heat, extreme cold, fatigue, and other stressors. And then they get all stressed up because of the hormones, and then they get sick and probably die if the shepherd doesn't do something. Well, as the sheep, Paul is persuaded that nothing's going to ever separate us from the love of God. And then, in this provision in the perfect solution and, and, and answer for that problem that we face, we see also it's abundant life. There in John chapter 10, verse 10. That they might have life and, and that they might have it more abundantly. And we see that in verse 29, there's a description of the abundant life, which is eternal. It says, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So life in my Father's hand, it's protected and you're provided for. The abundant life. And I was thinking of how uh, there's one there's one old preacher back in the 60s, I think, he, he was involved in the civil rights movement, but there's a clip that is on YouTube of his that I've mentioned before and I really like. 
And he's just describing taking five minutes to, to just talk about the Lord Jesus and who he is. And he's just listing off all these things. And then he says, he says, he's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. Well, what's the superlative? Well, you have, there's these three different ways that you can, I guess it's, that you can use adjectives. Okay, we'll break it down here. We can talk about Joseph and I, okay? Joseph and Ben and I, but Ben's not here at the moment. But we can say that Ben is fast. That's the declarative. I'm declaring that Ben is fast. But I'm fast. That's the comparative. I'm comparing me and Ben while well, I'm faster than Ben. But the superlative, we would say, well, probably between us three, well, Joseph's the fastest. <laughs> well, the Lord Jesus is the superlative. So anything, and we saw that with the Good Shepherd. Pick some adjective. Rich. The Lord Jesus is the richest. Strong. The Lord Jesus is the strongest. And you can go on down through the list. And the thing is, because he's all of that in such infinite degree that's indescribable, well, if we're with him, we partake in that. We, we get a part of that. And so when he gives us life, he doesn't just give us life. He doesn't just give us better life. He gives us the best life. More abundantly. It's like Joseph was saying, you know, there, the, the cup running over. You have so much in, in the shepherd that you have enough to give to other people. Now, we realize, of course, because we already talked about the conditions, that this, is, this abundant life is not sunny days, green grass, happy, carefree, there's trials, there's heartache, there's sorrow. But the abundant life is being delighted in Jesus Christ, and being usable, and being used in His kingdom. And we can, we can think about Psalm 23, well, we have the valley of the shadow of death, but thou art with me. And we have the presence of mine enemies, but thou preparest the table. And then we have, well, there's death, I'm going to die, but I will dwell with the Lord forever and ever. So don't be afraid of sacrificing, of giving up something. Because, you know, I can tell you that, that sin has consequences and penalties, and that there's sorrow and sin. But I can also tell you that the Lord Jesus, you know, when you think of what well, you know, you think of being young and having all these, I would like to do this with my life. I would like to do that. I would like to experience this in my life. And sometimes you realize that the Lord Jesus, as the shepherd, he's calling you out of that. And he's putting his finger on, on that where you have to say, okay, I, I have to give that up. But sometimes it's not the giving up. It's just that you have to be willing to give it up because you have to realize that there's that thing that you've treasured for so long and it's become sort of like a little idol and where you said to the shepherd, well, I won't follow you unless you give me this. But he has to take that away or he has to make you realize that you had that too much of a priority in your life. And so you give up and then, well, sometimes your desires do change and what you want long for, you don't anymore because he's giving you something better. <coughs> but other times, maybe that was okay. But you have to realize that the Lord Jesus, the shepherd, came first. And then he, he gives you all that thing. He gives you the kingdom. And there's another hymn. It says, O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead. And from the ground there blossoms red, life that shall endless be. And I was reading a book recently about these two people that were seeking to follow God and realizing that they had to make sacrifices, hard sacrifices. And they compared themselves to Abraham there when he had to give up Isaac. But the way they saw it or they experienced it was that it was like Isaac had already been burned up, you know, and all that was left was the ashes. And they say, well, but if, what, what will we do with the ashes? 
Well, you've got to give it to the Lord Jesus. Give everything to Him. And then even what seems like the deepest tragedy in your life, He'll move. What are ashes good for? You put them on the garden and they fertilize. And they're for the seed that you're going to plant. And so there's security and submission. There's triumph and trial. There's life in as you die to yourself. And so that gives us assurance and hope and everything in the shepherd that you can move forward. You can step out with Peter. You know, like I was saying, you know, all the other disciples stayed in the boat. And Peter stepped out. And you can step out in faith beyond the security that you've known that the Lord Jesus may be calling you out to that field, the unknown, the potential of service for Him. And not be afraid, even with all your inner struggles and conflicts and the sin and everything, because you know you have all you need in the shepherd, and He's enough. And so we come back to that question. Application. Have you ever said, Hear my Lord, send me, like Isaiah said? Have you ever come to that place where you want to follow the Lord Jesus? And if you haven't, you just have to give it all up. Give it all up to the Lord Jesus. Call out to Him. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to rescue you. You think of all your life, and sometimes life seems good, like Joseph was saying. But the end is death. And if you have begun to follow the shepherd, but you know, there's all that stuff that you start to look at sometimes, everything around, and you wonder how could God ever use me, or how could ever, how could I ever get victory over this? You just gotta get closer to the shepherd. That he could live his life through you. And that you could be used. So I pray that you think about these things.